right, I'll get started. Um, good morning and w welcome to WSA Tech Live. It's nice to see you in person this time. Yes, we did this last year on a Zoom call, I think. This location, a little better. Just, just a little. <laughs> Um, so last time we talked about, uh, you had just purchased ZeniMax, yeah. the parent of Bethesda, which makes a bunch of great games like Fallout, Elder Scrolls. And uh, I asked you at the time if you were done on your shopping spree or if you were still shopping around. And it uh, looks like you did make a, a pretty big deal. $75 billion for Activision Blizzard. Not done yet. Still in regulatory. That is true. Uh, but my question is, again, are, are we done shopping, or could we expect more deals for more gaming studios in the future? Well, you know, when we look at video games today, you know, over 3 billion people on the planet play video games, which is just kind of astounding. Nearly half the world's population plays video games. The business itself is a $200 billion business growing by almost double digits every year. So for us at Microsoft, we look at this category and we see a category that's in some transition uh, where we have some legacy and franchises that matter, and we're gonna continue to invest. I think it's something where we, we see the opportunity, we love the community around our games and our properties and our studios, uh, and the more we can build towards that future of more people playing, uh, I think it's a, it's a good business opportunity for the company and a good audience opportunity when you think about the age demographic that we attract as well. Okay, so more deals could be on the horizon. I'll, I'll keep my eyes peeled for that. Um, let's talk about the elephant in the room. A lot of us are familiar with the many allegations of sexual harassment at Activision. If the sale goes through, what do you want to say critics, to critics of that culture or to Activision employees about how that culture might change under your leadership? The, for all of us who are in positions of running large teams, like myself at Xbox, I think we always have to reflect on the culture that we have, ensuring our teams feel safe, feel included, feel heard where they can do their best work. Uh, we've, we've had our own journey at Xbox. You and I have talked about that in the past. I think it's always us looking at opportunities to learn uh, to listen to the, our employees, to our teams. I truly believe with every product that we ship, we ship our culture. People see whether it's front and center or it's subconsciously woven into the creative that we build, that the culture of our teams do, does show up in the products that we build. So ensuring that teams that are part of Xbox feel safe, feel heard, feel included, um, is critical to both any valuation and any future for our business. So does the accountability for an improved culture at Activision then lie with Microsoft? Um, is that something you plan to monitor closely and report back to shareholders? Uh, we do with all of our teams. I mean, one of the things at Microsoft that I've been very proud of in watching our own journey is how we disclose numbers around our employees, and we do that in a very public way. Um, even when sometimes the story needs to be, uh, when there's questions to be asked from some of the data that we're transparent about, and I think we will continue, we will definitely continue to do that with teams as they become part of Microsoft. Fundamentally, as the head of the business, I feel that the culture of our organization is my responsibility, um, but it is really a team-led thing. Managers matter a lot, our training, um, setting what our expectation is and following through on that expectation. Uh, it's probably the most important thing that I do in my role. Now, uh, this deal isn't uh, guaranteed to go through. Um, uh, we know that regulators are looking at it. And what happens if just one big jurisdiction says no, like uh, the UK, for example? What happens to the deal then if it's approved here in the US but not overseas? So it, it, it might be surprising to people, but I'm not an expert on doing $70 billion deals. <laughs> um, so. But I do know that we're very focused on getting approval in the major jurisdictions, and I'm spending a lot of time both in Brussels, London, and with the FTC here in the US. And I'd say the discussions have been, what I would say, very fair and honest, that it is a big acquisition. There's no doubt. Um, Microsoft and its role in the tech industry, we're a large tech company. And I do think that this, the discussion around an acquisition of this size is warranted, uh, and I've appreciated the time to go spend. We're really focused on getting the deal approved in the markets. I'm confident in that. Uh, where I was just in London last week, 
and continue to have discussions with all the regulatory boards and as I said, I remain confident that we'll get the deal approved. So one of the major sticking points, at least in the UK, about this deal is around Activision's Call of Duty franchise. Um, Microsoft has said that it plans to continue making that franchise available on all the different platforms. Yes, we do, yeah. Uh, but you haven't said for how long or for how much. I mean, could this change at some point? Could a couple years down the road you say it's exclusive to Xbox Game Pass or it's exclusive for people who want to stream it, but if you want to buy it a disc, you could play it on, uh, say, PlayStation? That's not our plan. Our plan is that Call of Duty specifically would be available um, on PlayStation is what you're asking about, but when I think about our plans, I'd love to see it on the Switch. I would love to see, uh, I'd love to see the game playable on, on many different screens. But if we circle back to why this deal is important to us, when you're, you're, you're spending the amount that we're spending looking at the opportunity in gaming, this opportunity is really about mobile for us. And I know, as you said, most of the dialogue that's out there has been around consoles and how Xbox and PlayStation consoles compete mm -hmm. with each other. But when you think about 3 billion people playing video games, there's only about 200 million households that play on console. A vast majority of the people who play, play on the device that's already in their pocket, which is their phone. The thing that made us really interested in Activision Blizzard King was the great work that the teams there had done in building such large mobile followings. A lot of that with the King studio that they have with Candy Crush, which is a big franchise a lot of people know. But also if you look at Call of Duty Mobile, which to me actually in the strategic rationale behind this deal is more interesting than what's happening on console between Xbox and PlayStation with this franchise that will continue to ship on PlayStation. Um, natively, we don't, mm -hmm. it's not a plan of, okay, we're gonna bait and switch somebody where they gotta play on the cloud or that at two or three years we're gonna pull the game. Our intent is that we would continue to ship Call of Duty on PlayStation um, as long as that made sense, mm -hmm. you know, as long as like, tech is always in some mm -hmm. form of transition. But this deal for us really centered around our opportunity to get more mobile engagement in Xbox mm -hmm. and the great work that the teams had done there. But why is uh, Microsoft making future Bethesda games like the next Elder Scrolls exclusive to Game Pass? One of the reasons people pick different consoles is looking at the exclusive games that are available. If you think about Nintendo, a, a, a platform I love. I mean, people think of Zelda, Mario. These are iconic franchises that are available on those platforms. For us, we have franchises like Halo and Forza and things that people love, and Sony has their own set of exclusive franchises. So as we're shipping things, we will definitely have new exclusive franchises coming to Xbox, there's no doubt. I'm just saying the, the public commitment, similar to when we acquired Minecraft, mm -hmm. Um, and you and I have talked about this, we acquired Minecraft, was it nine years ago now? And Minecraft, when we acquired it, was on, I think, 12 platforms, and now it's on like 22 platforms. Like, our intent is to treat Call of Duty very similar to the way we've treated Minecraft and putting it in many different places, because at this point, those are franchises that have reached broad global awareness, and I think more people should be able to play. That's special. Um, one of the things that came out through the deal making or uh, the antitrust uh, investigations is that Apple, um, I'm sorry, is that Microsoft is looking to expand its Xbox store to mobile devices. And I'm wondering, how is that possible since Apple doesn't allow third parties to operate stores on the iPhone and iPad? So is this a, is this a fantasy? How are you going to get around this? <laughs> well, it's definitely true today that the largest gaming platform on the planet, which is a mobile phone, is controlled by two companies, uh, Google and Apple. And not only do they only, they have the storefronts, whenever somebody says to go, you know, tells you to go find an app, it's discovery, it's monetization, it's search in many ways, people go to the stores to search. And we have to find a way to create more engagement and monetization for us in mobile. It's imperative for our business. There's no way that you succeed as a gaming company if you don't have access to mobile players. Uh, so how do we do that? I think it's, it's multifaceted. We have to break that duopoly of only two storefronts available on the largest platforms. If you look at Windows as an example, there's a multitude of storefronts available on Windows, and I think that creates healthy competition. We've also invested a lot in our cloud streaming, uh, where we're able to today stream Xbox games to the phone through, uh, through, through the internet. Uh, and that works. It's not native to the phone, so it's, uh, there's a little more friction that the platforms put in place for us actually getting to our customers. But if you take a long-term bet, which we're doing, that we will be able to get access to players on the largest platforms that people play on, which are these Android and iOS phones, 
we want to be in a position with content and players and storefront capability to take advantage of it because it's gaming is the largest form of monetization on mobile and we're a gaming company. Um, okay, but let's move on. Microsoft supported Epic Games, the maker of Fortnite, uh, in its battle against Apple over the App Store's 30% tax on digital sales. But while Microsoft said it's lowering the cut on, that it takes on its Xbox App Store, the company continues to take 30% on the console, how come? Yeah, consoles as a business model, one, it's, it's, as I said, in the overall scope of gaming, it's fairly small relative to the places that people play. Consoles evolved to a business model much different than phones, where consoles are actually sold at a loss in the market. So when somebody goes and they buy an Xbox at their local retailer, uh, we're subsidizing that purchase somewhere between $100 and $200 with the expectation that we will recoup that investment over time through accessory sales and storefront. Mobile phones are not sold at a loss. Mobile phones are profitable. They're general purpose computing devices. And much more like Windows, I think it should be a platform that's open. And as you said, on Windows, we have reduced our royalty because we look at Windows as a profitable business for us. And we want it to be a place where creators and players meet. And uh, you mentioned Epic. I think it's telling that Apple, in the res at the result of, the, of Epic raising a complaint, what did they do? They threw out the largest game in the world from their store. And it just shows the market power a company has if the result of you complaining about it is you get, kind of th you get thrown out of get the booted. store. How has uh, Microsoft's conversation with Apple evolved since uh, that lawsuit and, and that trial? Um, has Apple shown any openness at all in maybe allowing cloud gaming? Uh, what Apple specifically asked us to do was to use the web browser, which we've done. So if you, you can use the Safari web browser on a phone. It's not the natural place people go to find games, but it does work today. And we have Fortnite available on iOS phones, not an ad, but that is the way you can play um, on iOS phones is through our streaming technology on the phones. But there's so much friction going from somebody tells you, hey, you should go play this game, you should go find uh, this new app, Nobody thinks to go to a web browser and then search for it. So it's, there's so much work for us to do to overcome the friction. Um, and on and Android, we actually do have an app in the store. We're just not able to monetize. So we actually can put the app there, but it's hard without actually being able to monetize the content to think that you're creating a business. Um, speaking of cloud gaming or the Netflix streaming of games, um, I mean, Microsoft's pretty, pretty big on this technology, but and, and it's part of the Game Pass, but just last month we saw Google give up on its cloud gaming service Stadia. So are we just not ready for cloud gaming yet? Like what's Microsoft doing to succeed in this realm where Google did not? Our approach has been to give our customers choice in how they play. We haven't gone out and tried to tell people that they should not play on their PC or they should not play on their phone or their gaming console. We look at cloud as an option for people maybe when they're away from their console or PC or they're on a device like that tablet right there and they want to play a game, that tablet's not going to run most console games. So we're able to stream to that device. I think other people have gone out and tried to make it a real either or choice. You're either playing on streaming or you're not. And we've taken a much more customer driven fo focus. We have a subscription, as you say, you can buy games, you can subscribe. If you subscribe, you're able to stream those games to any device with a web browser. And I think giving the customer the choice, putting the customer at the center of our decision making, uh, has led to more success for us. And I think we just announced we crossed 20 million people who have tried our uh, cloud streaming. It's early. I'm not, I don't have a, a vision where everybody's on cloud, nobody's buying a piece mm -hmm. of hardware. I don't think that's the future, but giving customers choice we've found is good business. Speaking of hardware and cloud, um, there's a lot of scuttlebutt about the Keystone stream service you're working on. So what's that gonna look like? And is that the spell the end of the Xbox console? Is it gonna be like the Blackberry? So there was a, a picture that went out, which was uh, Keystone, he said, was the code name of something that we were incubating internally, which was, think of it as a streaming console, so there's no local gameplay, low cost, plug it into a television, and you'd be able to stream to the television, the video game, the Xbox games that are available. We instead, back kind of the uh, late spring, pivoted to working with Samsung. Um, we put an app on Samsung TVs that let you play Xbox games. Um, and I still have the prototype. It sits on the shelf behind my, uh, my, my computer. So there was a picture that went out of that device. 
giving people choice, whether they want to play on that tablet, whether they want to play on their smart TV, they want to play on an Xbox, mm -hmm. they want to play on a PC. Uh, we think that's that's really critical to where we're going. Um, it's, will we do a streaming device at some point? I suspect we will, but I think it's it's years away. And even in our consoles today, mm -hmm. we have two consoles in the market. Again, giving people choice about one's two ninety nine, one's four ninety nine. Um, giving people choice on like how much money they want to spend to go play and what device is right for them. Speaking of the Xbox Series X and S and X, um, we know that last year Santa Claus really struggled to get enough of those on the store shelves. Uh, how are things now? How's the supply chain going? Supply chain has improved for us, uh, specifically on the Series S. Then, for those that not tra aren't tracking, it's the smaller of the two consoles. You can find them in, on the shelves in stores, which is great. That's the position we want to be in, where we mm -hmm. have weeks on hand of inventory. People can walk in in the holiday times and find a gift. And I think on S, we will be in good shape this holiday that we'll have ample supply. I think our larger console, the 499 console Series X, will likely still have some supply issues in certain markets. Um, demand is just incredibly high. We've mm -hmm. sold more consoles at this point in the generation than any prior Xbox generation. So while the problem gets presented often as a supply chain problem and a supply issue, and clearly we'd love to be doing better on supply, um, it has really been as much a demand issue that customers are just voting with their feet and they find good value in gaming as a form of entertainment. And it's proven over the years at a time of economic uncertainty for families that gaming is somewhat resilient to those issues. Um, because you find that playing video games is a, for a family is fairly cost effective and it's fun. But let's also point out this year um, we're seeing a lot more of the AAA blockbuster games uh, priced at $70. And granted, it has been a long time since the price of a, a AAA game has gone up. I mean, it's been 60 for, for, for the longest time. Yeah. Um, but it also seems like an inopportune time for this to be happening when uh, inflation's high and we're t there's talk of a recession. Um, what do you say to parents whose kids are, you know, scrambling this Christmas for, um, you know, these $70 games? I mean, that's a that's a high price for some folks. Yeah, I think that for. The price point on retail for video games, you said, it hasn't gone up in a while. And I think for creators, the cost of building the games has gone up. Um, the hours of enjoyment that you get in a video game is pretty strong if you looked at, I don't know that people do this math, but the hours of, inter of enjoyment versus, versus what I spent. But people can play video games for hundreds of hours. Um, so I still believe in the value of video games. Uh, we've, we, you've mentioned it a couple times. We have a subscription called Game Pass which allows people to build their library of games that they own in a different way. Um, you can pay a monthly subscription $10 or $15 and get access to hundreds of games. We think it's important to offer our customers choice in how they build their library, especially as you say at a time where economic uncertainty is putting families um, under pressure, energy issues in Europe, putting families under pressure, um, and we look at gaming as a real option. For us running the business, you know, we have to look at the return on our business, the cost of the business. We've held price on our console. We've held price on games for us and our subscription. You know, I don't think we'll be able to do that forever. I do think at some point we'll have to raise some prices on certain things. Um, but going into this holiday, we thought it was really important that we maintain the prices that we have um, because we think, as you said, consumers right now are more uncertain than they have been in a long time. And I want our medium of video games to be something that they find attractive. Um, let's talk about Game Pass a little bit more since that's a, a big bet for Microsoft. How many uh, subscribers do we have now? And it, it does seem like a really good deal for the consumer, but what about the Microsoft investor? How is this a moneymaker for Microsoft? Our last public number was 25 million subscribers that we've talked about. Can we get an update? <laughs> <laughs> Not right here, but... Uh, we did talk about growth on PC, so our Game Pass subscription, not expecting everybody's following the video game market, is available on gaming consoles and on personal computers, um, and you can subscribe in, in both places. We're seeing incredible growth on PC. I think Satya in our earnings, Satya Nadella, in our earnings yesterday, the CEO of Microsoft talked about, I think, 130, 140% year-over-year growth on PC, which is really where we're focused. On console, I've seen growth slow down on Game Pass, mainly because at some point you've just reached everybody on console who wants to subscribe. Um, and we don't see subscription, unlike some other forms of media that have really moved almost solely to a subscription business. Today, Game Pass as an overall 
part of our content and service revenue is probably 15%. I don't think it gets bigger than that. I think the overall revenue grows, so 15% of a bigger number is a bigger number. But we don't have this future where I think 50, 60, 70% of our revenue comes from subscriptions. The largest business model in video games is free to play. You download a game that's free. You and I were talking about Fall Guys, mm -hmm. great game, or Fortnite. These are games that you have a device, you can download the game, and then they will sell you things in-game to monetize so that they do actually run a business in the game, but you're not forced to go buy those things um, in order to go play the game. That's the largest gaming business model across all screens is free to play. As you mentioned, there's retail. People still buy video games, a lot of them. That's far larger than Game Pass is for us. And we have the option of a subscription, which we love as a choice, but not to the extent, not trying to kind of uh, cannibalize the other businesses. We see it as just a customer choice. And I think it will stay in that 10 to 15% of our overall revenue, and it's profitable for us. Great. Let's talk a little about the metaverse. <laughs> Very popular topic uh, at WSA Tech Live. Um, has it been? I, it has been a topic. Uh, yeah. It has. Um, I could borrow from Joanna Stern and say the metaverse is, in your definition, Today I'd say, I'm gonna get in trouble when I say this, it's a, a poorly built video game. <laughs> like if I think about video games for years, we've been putting people together in 3D spaces to go and save the world from the invading aliens or ca conquer the castle. And our, our designers have learned to build empathy between players, engagement loops, interaction models lighting models that give worlds from Minecraft to you know, ancient Egypt. We have video game creators have an amazing ability to build compelling worlds that we want to go spend time in. I don't know, for me, building a metaverse that looks like a meeting room, I, I just find that's not where I want to spend most of my time. When I think about characters and the models and how they look, I want something that's engaging. I want to be able to put my identity on how I look because um, I do in every other form. Whenever I'm playing a game, I create my avatar, and I'll, I'll pretend this is what I look like, wish this is what I look like, I don't. Um, and I, I think what I, I see in the metaverse world is we're at the early, early stages. And I think this will evolve, because I do believe it's important that we embrace that not everybody's gonna live in the same location, like the last three years have taught us that. And there are engagement models where we can really have productive interaction, get things done, in 3D virtualized spaces. I think they're gonna end up looking a lot more like video games than some of the models that I see for the metaverse today. Mm -hmm. I think the skill set of our industry will be very applicable to that market as we're building out mm -hmm. those kind of interaction models, which makes it great for the talent in our teams. They'll have more opportunity. So I tease a little bit in being a bad video game. I just think we're early. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, that's where I, I think it goes. Like we're gonna learn from what video games have done. Now, Sony has a PlayStation VR. Meta has Oculus. Microsoft has HoloLens, but that's not really something for gamers. What is Microsoft doing or thinking about doing in the hardware space when it comes to virtual or augmented reality for gamers? So as it relates to the conversation about metaverse, I'll just say my perspective is you have to be able to interact in the metaverse on a 2D display. I don't think we're gonna go into a world or metaverse won't really take off if the first thing I need to do is put a helmet on my head. Now. If I go and I wanna go put a device on my head to make it more interactive and to create more immersive space, absolutely there's gonna be options out there to do that. We have a ton of them on Windows. You mentioned Sony does a good job with VR. I love the Quest Pro. I got to, uh, Meta came up and I got to play with that and we showed some game streaming um, inside of that experience. But today I think the experience itself is more software led than hardware led. I think a lot of times we, we kind of put on top of, well, if we're doing metaverse, then it has to exist in VR, it has to exist in AR. I think those will be extensions of what people do in the metaverse, but most people will still be sitting on a 2D display like you have, mm -hmm. and we've gotta get that engagement model right first. And much like in video games, there are video games that are great in VR, but most video games happen on 2D displays that people are playing. And I think metaverse, in order for it to really take off, has to figure out how to work in 2D. Another aspect of the metaverse um, that's come up a lot, especially with regard to gaming, is the topic of non-fungible tokens, NFTs. Yeah. It's, I, I get the sense that the gamer uh, community is not a fan. 
Uh, you got that sense. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. Um, and I know Minecraft has said nope to creators who want to go down that path um, with the um, Minecraft IP. So what, where's this coming from? Why do they have such a bad rap among gamers? And, and will that change over time? So as you, somebody mentioned before I came out that you know, I've been at Microsoft for an awful long time. I started as an intern um, many, many decades ago writing code. And I often find that technologists start with what the technology is, how it was built, why we're so proud of how it was built. And say in the gaming community, what our customers want to know first is how does it benefit them? What is it, how does it make their lives better? So when you start with something like blockchain or NFT and you lead with that as the qualifier for what I'm building, I don't know, like I have to first figure out what this acronym stands for. And they're kind of three weird words stuck together. I don't even know what those three words mean. And like the work that we're putting on a customer to actually understand why there's a benefit to them is so difficult. I understand the gamer backlash to don't start with me on here's a technology that's may or may not make your life better. Because there have been too many times when technologies have been presented to people and um, in the end it's made my life either more difficult or even exploitive in some ways. And we've seen that with NFTs. My view is there are some benefits to entitlements that I own in digital spaces being more open than they are today. If you think about any of the digital items that you buy today, those digital items are somewhat weirdly from you to a storefront on a platform. Like you have to buy one copy of something and you only, if you wanna use the term own it, own it through that storefront on that platform. Like there's nothing else in the real world that works like this. Like if I buy this mug, I can take it anywhere I want. I don't, it's not like locked into being at this hotel. Right, but your virtual skin in one game doesn't necessarily transfer over to another game. It might not even transfer to a copy of that same game on another platform. But I wanna know if I buy a virtual outfit, um, I want to know that it's mine, and if I get tired of it later on, maybe I want to sell it to somebody. Exactly. So I am a believer in the long run that the digital economy should be more open, and I should have more rights in the digital items that I've owned or I've invested in or I've even built. Whether NFT is the enabler of that, let's like say that remains to be seen, but I think leading with something with a customer, which is mm -hmm. I've spent my whole life like in a consumer business, with here's the value to you. Hey, if you bought that dress, you could use that dress on an Xbox or a PC or your iPhone. And there are some games that do this. Minecraft does this, Fortnite does this, where your items actually do span across multiple devices and multiple storefronts, but it's not the norm. You know, at the end of my life, I can't easily will my music collection to anybody. I don't really have those rights today the way that the digital items have been entitled. So I, like I said, I, I do think more open entitlement systems are valuable to customers. I would just encourage us in technology to lead with customer benefit and not lead with how we built it or the technology behind it. Gotcha, don't have to figure it out afterwards. Um, Earlier on, we talked a little bit about mobile and how mobile is such a big part of gaming. And it, it's kind of surprising because we all, a lot of us grew up with consoles um, and, and now we, we play on the, these small little tiny phones. Um, Microsoft has made a large number of uh, studio acquisitions uh, and, and with the Activision deal will even be bigger. So what, um, which studios are, are, are they working on any mobile games? Will we see, uh, I mean, I, Microsoft does have some mobile games, but not a ton. Not enough. Um, so are we working on maybe a mobile version of Halo and I'm not counting Spartan Assault? We, uh, <laughs> we're working on a lot of, of mobile works. We just announced yesterday Age of Empires coming to mobile, which I think will be great. People will love that. Minecraft does very well on mobile. The, but the truth of the matter is the creators behind mobile games have a different skill set than the creators behind console or PC games. And I'm not saying one's better or worse, they're just different. Um, maybe like building a television series is different than building a feature movie. Like the drama arcs are different, the engagement loops are different. These are all the things that go into game design geekdom that we think a lot about as we're designing games. So it's not as easy as taking a team that has built a mega blockbuster kind of 
think about the, the, the Hollywood blockbuster released game, a big retail game, and saying, oh, can we just build a mobile game? Because right. the business model is different, it's not just screen size, things that are fundamental to how people play, which is why when we look at things like the Activision, we look at teams like King, the work behind COD Mobile, the learning there, Call of Duty Mobile, we think that's critical to add. Because it's, we need a creative capability on mobile devices in order for us to continue to grow our business the way we need so to So maybe that's where the next acquisitions will be and more mobile dedicated studios going forward? It's clearly a hole for us. If we look in our portfolio, I love geographic diversity and where our teams are. I think having more voices, too many people in the tech industry look and sound like me. Um, and when we're talking about 3 billion people who play video games, our customer is anybody on the planet. Um, and our teams need to reflect the customers that we aspire to earn through our products. That's not just what we look like, but what we sound like in our lived experiences. Mm -hmm. We now have teams in Lagos, Nigeria, and Santiago, Chile, and other places. And most of those kind of locations, take like a, a, a Lagos is perfect, there's a lot of gaming activity in the market. Everybody has a phone. The number of consoles that'll ever be sold in a market like that is de minimis, right? It's it right. almost non-existent. So I want to meet customers where they are and have teams that know how to build creative that they will find interesting. We are low on time here. I'm going to sneak in, try and sneak in two more. Um, if Microsoft could buy any game or any game studio, what would it be? <laughs> or if you could pick? That's a, I can't answer that. <laughs> um, what I will say is investing in our creative capability, which is... The, by far and away, the largest part of Team Xbox are our studio teams. Um, a couple right here in Irvine, California, and one in, in Santa Monica. Um, that's the most important thing. Okay. Gamers play games, and we need to have great games that people want to play. And I will close with probably the most important question coming from a little girl back home in New Jersey. Why are there no snakes in Minecraft? When are we getting snakes in Minecraft? When are we getting snakes in Minecraft? I can't announce uh, when we're getting snakes in Minecraft, uh, but let me quickly, I know we're out of time. You know, Minecraft is such an amazing property for us. We learn so much from the community, uh, the community of creators, the community of players, the joy it brings to so many people. And we love requests from your daughter on why we don't have snakes. We just added camels, that was our last add to Minecraft. Um, but I, I just often think about us as stewards of that IP, not really owners of that IP, because it really is a franchise that's owned by the people who play and their love for it and their love for snakes. So I will put it in the queue. I will put it in the list. All right, Mr. Spencer. <laughs> that's my snake ending for you. All right, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thanks.